This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 21 The small bright lawn stretched away smoothly to the big bright sea. The turf was hemmed with an edge of scarlet geranium and coleus, and cast-iron vases painted in chocolate color, standing at intervals along the winding path that led to the sea, looped their garlands of petunia and ivy geranium above the neatly raked gravel. Halfway between the edge of the cliff and the square wooden house, which was also chocolate-colored, but with a tin roof of the veranda striped in yellow and brown to represent an awning, two large targets had been placed against a background of shrubbery. On the other side of the lawn, facing the targets, was pitched a real tent, with benches and garden seats about it. A number of ladies in summer dresses and gentlemen in grey frock-coats and tall hats, stood on the lawn or sat upon the benches. And every now and then a slender girl, in starched muslin, would step from the tent, bow in hand, and speed her shaft at one of the targets, while the spectators interrupted their talk to watch the result. Newland Archer, standing on the veranda of the house, looked curiously down upon this scene. On each side of the shiny painted steps was a large blue china flower pot on a bright yellow china stand. A spiky green plant filled each pot, and below the veranda ran a wide border of blue hydrangeas, edged with more red geraniums. Behind him, the French windows of the drawing-rooms through which he had passed gave glimpses, between swaying lace curtains, of glassy parquet floors islanded with chintz poofs, dwarf armchairs, and velvet tables covered with trifles in silver. The Newport Archery Club always held its August meeting at the Beauforts. The sport, which had hitherto known no rival but croquet, was beginning to be discarded in favor of lawn tennis, but the latter game was still considered too rough and inelegant for social occasions, and as an opportunity to show off pretty dresses and graceful attitudes, the bow and arrow held their own. Archer looked down with wonder at the familiar spectacle. It surprised him that life should be going on in the old way, when his own reactions to it had so completely changed. It was Newport that had first brought home to him the extent of the change. In New York, during the previous winter, after he and May had settled down in the new greenish-yellow house with the bow window and the Pompeian vestibule, he had dropped back with relief into the old routine of the office and the renewal of this daily activity had served as a link with his former self. Then there had been the pleasurable excitement of choosing a showy grey stepper for May's broom, the Wellens had given the carriage, and the abiding occupation and interest of arranging his new library, which, in spite of family doubts and disapprovals, had been carried out as he had dreamed, with a dark embossed paper, East Lake bookcases and sincere armchairs and tables. At the Century he had found Winsett again, and at the Knickerbocker the fashionable young men of his own set, and what with the hours dedicated to the law, and those given to dining out or entertaining friends at home, with an occasional evening at the opera or the play, the life he was living had still seemed a fairly real and inevitable sort of business. But Newport represented the escape from duty into an atmosphere of unmitigated holiday-making. 
Archer had tried to persuade May to spend the summer on a remote island off the coast of Maine, called, appropriately enough, Mount Desert, where a few hardy Bostonians and Philadelphians were camping in native cottages, and whence came reports of enchanting scenery and a wild, almost trapper-like existence amid woods and waters. But the Wellens always went to Newport, where they owned one of the square boxes on the cliffs, and their son-in-law could adduce no good reason why he and May should not join them there. As Mrs. Welland rather tartly pointed out, it was hardly worthwhile for May to have worn herself out trying on summer clothes in Paris, if she was not to be allowed to wear them. And this argument was of a kind to which Archer had as yet found no answer. May herself could not understand his obscure reluctance to fall in with so reasonable and pleasant a way of spending the summer. She reminded him that he had always liked Newport in his bachelor days, and as this was indisputable, he could only profess that he was sure he was going to like it better than ever now that they were going to be there together. But as he stood on the Beaufort veranda and looked out over the brightly peopled lawn, it came home to him, with a shiver, that he was not going to like it at all. It was not May's fault, poor dear, if now and then, during their travels, they had fallen slightly out of step, harmony had been restored by their return to the conditions she was used to. He had always foreseen that she would not disappoint him, and he had been right. He had married, as most young men did, because he had met a perfectly charming girl at the moment when a series of rather aimless sentimental adventures were ending in premature disgust and she had represented peace, stability, comradeship, and the steadying sense of an inescapable duty. He could not say that he had been mistaken in his choice, for she had fulfilled all that he had expected. It was undoubtedly gratifying to be the husband of one of the handsomest and most popular young married women in New York, especially when she was also one of the sweetest-tempered, and most reasonable of wives. And Archer had never been insensible to such advantages. As for the momentary madness, which had fallen upon him on the eve of his marriage, he had trained himself to regard it as the last of his discarded experiments. The idea that he could ever, in his senses, have dreamed of marrying the Countess Olenska had become almost unthinkable and she remained in his memory simply as the most plaintive and poignant of a line of ghosts. But all these abstractions and eliminations made of his mind a rather empty and echoing place, and he supposed that was one of the reasons why the busy animated people on the Beaufort lawn shocked him, as if they had been children playing in a graveyard. He heard a murmur of skirts beside him, and the Marchioness Manson fluttered out of the drawing-room window. As usual, she was extraordinarily festooned and bedizened, with a limp leghorn hat, anchored to her head by many wingings of faded gauze, and a little black velvet parasol on a carved ivory handle, absurdly balanced over her much larger hat-brim. "'My dear Newland, I had no idea that you and May had arrived. "'You yourself came only yesterday, you say. "'Ah, oh, business, business, professional duties, I understand. "'Many husbands I know find it impossible to join their wives here "'except for the weekend.' "'She cocked her head on one side "'and languished at him through screwed-up eyes. "'But marriage is one long sacrifice, "'as I often used to remind my Ellen.' Archer's heart stopped, with the queer jerk which it had given once before, and which seemed suddenly to slam a door between himself and the outer world. But this break of continuity must have been of the briefest, for he presently heard Medora answering a question he had apparently found voice to put. 
no, I'm not staying here, but with the Blankers in their delicious solitude at Portsmouth. Beaufort was kind enough to send his Miss Trotters for me this morning, so that I might have at least a glimpse of one of Regina's garden parties. But this evening I go back to rural life. The Blankers, dear original beings, have hired a primitive old farmhouse at Portsmouth where they gather about them representative people. She drooped slightly beneath her protecting brim, and added with a faint blush, This week, Dr. Agathon Carver is holding a series of inner thought meetings there. A contrast indeed to this gay scene of worldly pleasure, but then I have always lived on contrasts. To me, the only death is monotony. I always say to Ellen, Beware of monotony. It's the mother of all the deadly sins. But my poor child is going through a phase of exaltation, of abhorrence of the world. You know, I suppose that she has declined all invitations to stay at Newport, even with her grandmother Mingott. I could hardly persuade her to come with me to the Blenkers, if you will believe it. This life she leads is morbid, unnatural. Ah, if she had only listened to me when it was still possible, when the door was still open, but... Shall we go down and watch this absorbing match? I hear your May is one of the competitors. Strolling towards them from the tent, Beaufort advanced over the lawn, tall, heavy, too tightly buttoned into a London frock coat, with one of his own orchids in its buttonhole. Archer, who had not seen him for two or three months, was struck by the change in his appearance. In the hot summer light, his floridness seemed heavy and bloated, and but for his erect, square-shouldered walk, he would have looked like an overfed and overdressed old man. There were all sorts of rumors afloat about Beaufort. In the spring he had gone off on a long cruise to the West Indies in his new steam yacht, and it was reported that, at various points where he had touched, a lady resembling Miss Fanny Ring had been seen in his company. The steam yacht, built in the Clyde and fitted with tiled bathrooms and other un luxuries, was said to have cost him half a million, and the pearl necklace which he had presented to his wife on his return was as magnificent as such expiatory offerings are apt to be. Beaufort's fortune was substantial enough to stand the strain, and yet the disquieting rumors persisted not only in Fifth Avenue, but in Wall Street. Some people said he had speculated, unfortunately, in railways, others that he was being bled by one of the most insatiable members of her profession, and to every report of threatened insolvency, Beaufort replied by a fresh extravagance, the building of a new row of orchid houses, the purchase of a new string of racehorses, or the addition of a new messionnaire or cabanal to his picture gallery. He advanced towards the Marchioness and Newland with his usual half-sneering smile. Hello, Medora. Did the trotters do their business? Forty minutes, eh? Well, that's not so bad, considering your nerves had to be spared. He shook hands with Archer, and then, turning back with them, placed himself on Mrs. Manson's other side and said, in a low voice, a few words which their companion did not catch. The marchioness replied by one of her queer foreign jerks and a que voulez-vous, which deepened Beaufort's frown, but he produced a good semblance of a congratulatory smile as he glanced at Archer to say, You know, May's going to carry off the first prize. Ah, oh, then it remains in the family, Medora rippled, and at that moment they reached the tent, and Mrs. Beaufort met them in a girlish cloud of mauve muslin and floating veils. May Welland was just coming out of the tent. In her white dress, with a pale green ribbon about the waist and a wreath of ivy on her hat, she had the same Diana-like aloofness as when she had entered the Beaufort ballroom on the night of her engagement. In the interval, not a thought seemed to have passed behind her eyes or a feeling through her heart. And though her husband knew that she had the capacity for both, he marveled afresh at the way in which experience dropped away from her. 
she had her bow and arrow in her hand, and placing herself on the chalk mark traced on the turf, she lifted the bow to her shoulder and took aim. The attitude was so full of a classic grace that a murmur of appreciation followed her appearance, and Archer felt the glow of proprietorship that so often cheated him into momentary well-being. Her rivals, Mrs. Reggie Chivers, the Mary Girls, and the diverse, rosy, Thorleys, Dagonets, and Mingotts, stood behind her in a lovely, anxious group. Brown heads and golden, bent above the scores, and pale muslins and flower-wreathed hats mingled in a tender rainbow. All were young and pretty, and bathed in summer bloom, but not one had the nymph-like ease of his wife when, with tense muscles and a happy frown, she bent her soul upon some feat of strength. "'Gad,' Archer heard Lawrence Lefford say, not one of a lot holds the bow as she does. And Beaufort retorted, Yes, but that's the only kind of target she'll ever hit. Archer felt irrationally angry. His host's contemptuous tribute to May's niceness was just what a husband should have wished to hear said to his wife. The fact that a coarse-minded man found her lacking in attraction was simply another proof of her quality, yet the words sent a faint shiver through his heart. What if niceness, carried to that supreme degree, were only a negation, the curtain dropped before an emptiness? As he looked at May, returning flushed and calm from her final bull's-eye, he had the feeling that he had never yet lifted that curtain. She took the congratulations of her rivals and of the rest of the company with a simplicity that was her crowning grace— no one could ever be jealous of her triumphs, because she managed to give the feeling that she would have been just as serene if she had missed them. But when her eyes met her husband's, her face glowed with the pleasure she saw in his. Mr. Welland's basket-work pony carriage was waiting for them, and they drove off among the dispersing carriages, May handling the reins, and Archer sitting at her side. The afternoon sunlight still lingered upon the bright lawns and shrubberies, and up and down Bellevue Avenue rolled a double line of Victorias, dog carts, landaus, and vis a vis, carrying well dressed ladies and gentlemen away from the Beaufort Garden Party, or homeward from their daily afternoon turn along the Ocean Drive. Shall we go see Granny? May suddenly proposed. I should like to tell her myself that I've won the prize. There's lots of time before dinner. Archer acquiesced, and she turned the ponies down Narragansett Avenue, crossed Spring Street, and drove out towards the rocky moorland beyond. In this unfashionable region, Catherine the Great, always indifferent to precedent and thrifty of purse, had built herself in her youth a many-peaked and cross-beamed cottage orné, on a bit of cheap land overlooking the bay. Here, in a thicket of stunted oaks, her verandas spread themselves above the island-dotted waters. A winding drive led up between iron stags and blue glass balls embedded in mounds of geraniums to a front door of highly varnished walnut under a striped veranda roof. And behind it ran a narrow hall with a black-and-yellow star-patterned parquet floor, upon which opened four small square rooms, with heavy flocked papers, under ceilings on which an Italian house-painter had lavished all the divinities of Olympus. One of these rooms had been turned into a bedroom by Mrs. Mingott, when the burden of flesh descended on her, and in the adjoining one she spent her days, enthroned in a large armchair, between the open door and the window and perpetually waving a palm-leaf fan, which the prodigious projection of her bosom kept so far from the rest of her person, that the air it set in motion stirred only the fringe of the antimacassars on the chair arms. Since she had been the means of hastening his marriage, old Catherine had shown to Archer the cordiality which a service rendered 
excites toward the person served. She was persuaded that irrepressible passion was the cause of his impatience, and being an ardent admirer of impulsiveness, when it did not lead to the spending of money, she always received him with a genial twinkle of complicity, and a play of allusion to which May seemed fortunately impervious. She examined and appraised, with much interest, the diamond-tipped arrow which had been pinned on May's bosom at the conclusion of the match, remarking that in her day a filigree brooch would have been thought enough, but that there was no denying that Beaufort did things handsomely. "'Quite an heirloom, in fact, my dear,' the old lady chuckled. "'You must leave it in fee to your eldest girl.' She pinched May's white arm and watched the color flood her face. "'Well, well, what if I said to make you shake out the red flag? Ain't there going to be any daughters, only boys, eh? Good gracious, look at her blushing again all over her blushes. What can't I say that either? Mercy me! When my children beg me to have all those gods and goddesses painted out overhead, I always say I'm too thankful to have somebody about me that nothing can shock.' Archer burst into a laugh, and May echoed it crimson to the eyes. Well, now, tell me all about the party, please, my dears, for I shall never get a straight word about it out of that silly Medora, the ancestress continued, and as May exclaimed, Aunt Medora? But I thought she was going back to Portsmouth. She answered placidly, So she is, but she's got to come here first to pick up Ellen. Oh, you don't know Ellen has come to spend the day with me, such fall de roll, her not coming for the summer, but I gave up arguing with young people about fifty years ago. "'Ellen! Ellen!' she cried in her shrill old voice, trying to bend forward far enough to catch a glimpse of the lawn beyond the veranda. There was no answer, and Mrs. Mingott rapped impatiently with her stick on the shiny floor. A mulatto maidservant in a bright turban, replying to the summons, informed her mistress that she had seen Miss Ellen going down the path to the shore— and Miss Mingott turned to Archer. Run down and fetch her like a good grandson. This pretty lady will describe the party to me, she said. And Archer stood up as if in a dream. He had heard the Countess Olenska's name pronounced often enough during the year and a half since they had last met, and was even familiar with the main incidents of her life in the interval. He knew that she had spent the previous summer at Newport, where she appeared to have gone a great deal into society, but that in the autumn she had suddenly sublet the perfect house which Beaufort had been at such pains to find for her, and decided to establish herself in Washington. There, during the winter, he heard of her, as one always heard of pretty women in Washington, as shining in the brilliant diplomatic society that was supposed to make up for the social shortcomings of the administration. He had listened to these accounts, and to various contradictory reports on her appearance, her conversation, her point of view, and her choice of friends, with the detachment with which one listens to reminiscences of someone long since dead. Not till Medora suddenly spoke her name at the archery match had Ellen Olenska become a living presence to him again. The Marchioness's foolish lisp had called up a vision of a little firelit drawing-room, and the sound of carriage wheels returning down the deserted street. He thought of a story he had read of some peasant children in Tuscany, lighting a bunch of straw in a wayside cavern, and revealing old, silent images in their painted tomb. The way to the shore descended from the bank on which the house was perched, to a walk above the water planted with weeping willows. Through their veil, Archer caught the glint of the lime rock and the tiny house in which the heroic lighthouse keeper, Ida Lewis, was living her last venerable years. Beyond it lay the flat reaches and ugly government chimneys of Goat Island, the bay spreading northward in a shimmer of gold to Prudence Island, with its low growth of oaks and the shores of Connecticut faint in the sunset haze. From the willow walk projected a slight wooden pier, ending in a sort of pagoda-like summer-house, and in the pagoda a lady stood, leaning against the rail, 
her back to the shore. Archer stopped at the sight as if he had waked from sleep. That vision of the past was a dream, and the reality was what awaited him in the house on the bank overhead. Was Mrs. Welland's pony carriage circling around and around the oval at the door? Was May sitting under the shameless Olympians and glowing with secret hopes? Was the Welland villa at the far end of Bellevue Avenue, and Mr. Welland, already dressed for dinner and pacing the drawing-room floor, watch in hand, with dyspeptic impatience. For it was one of the houses in which one always knew exactly what is happening at a given hour. What am I? A son-in-law, Archer thought. The figure at the end of the pier had not moved. For a long moment... The young man stood halfway down the bank, gazing at the bay furrowed with coming and going of sailboats, yacht launches, fishing craft, and the trailing black coal barges hauled by noisy tugs. The lady in the summer house seemed to be held by the same sight. Beyond the gray bastions of Fort Adams, a long-drawn sunset was splintering up into a thousand fires, and the radiance caught the sail of a catboat as it beat out through the channel between the lime rock and the shore. Archer, as he watched, remembered the scene in the Chagrin, and Montague lifting Ada Dias's ribbon to his lips without her knowing that he was in the room. She doesn't know. She hasn't guessed. Should I know if she came up behind me, I wonder, he mused. And suddenly he said to himself, if she doesn't turn before the sail crosses the lime rock light, I'll go back. The boat was gliding out on the receding tide. It slid before the lime rock, blotted out Ida Lewis's little house, and passed along the turret in which the light was hung. Archer waited till a wide space of water sparkled between the last reef of the island and the stern of the boat. But still the figure in the summer house did not move. He turned and walked up the hill. "'I'm sorry you didn't find Ellen. I should have liked to see her again.' May said as they drove home through the dusk. But perhaps she wouldn't have cared. She seems so changed. Changed? echoed her husband in a colorless voice, his eyes fixed on the pony's twitching ears. So indifferent to her friends, I mean, giving up New York and her house, and spending her time with such queer people. Fancy how hideously uncomfortable she must be at the Blankers. She says she does it to keep Aunt Medora out of mischief, to prevent her marrying dreadful people, but I sometimes think we've always bored her. Archer made no answer, and she continued with a tinge of hardness that he had never before noticed in her frank, fresh voice. After all, I wonder if she wouldn't be happier with her husband. He burst into a laugh. Sancta simplicitas, he exclaimed. And as she turned a puzzled frown on him, he added, I don't think I ever heard you say a cruel thing before. Cruel? Well, watching the contortions of the damned, it is supposed to be a favorite sport of the angels, but I believe even they don't think people happier in hell. It's a pity she ever married abroad, then, said May, in the placid tone with which her mother met Mr. Welland's vagaries. And Archer felt himself gently relegated to the category of unreasonable husbands. They drove down Bellevue Avenue and turned in between the chamfered wooden gateposts surmounted by cast-iron lamps, which marked the approach to the Welland Villa. Lights were already shining through its windows, and Archer, as the carriage stopped, caught a glimpse of his father-in-law, exactly as he had pictured him, pacing the drawing-room, watch in hand, and wearing the pained expression that he had long since found to be much more efficacious than anger. The young man, as he followed his wife into the hall, was conscious 
of a curious reversal of mood. There was something about the luxury of the Welland house, and the density of the Welland atmosphere, so charged with minute observances and exactions, that always stole into his system like a narcotic. The heavy carpets, the watchful servants, the perpetually reminding tick of disciplined clocks, the perpetually renewed stack of cards and invitations on the hall table, and the whole chain of tyrannical trifles binding one hour to the next, and each member of the household to all the others, made any less systemized and affluent existence seem unreal and precarious. But now it was the Welland house, and the life he was expected to lead in it that had become unreal and irrelevant, and the brief scene on the shore, when he had stood irresolute, halfway down the bank, was as close to him as the blood in his veins. All night he lay awake in the big chintz bedroom at May's side, watching the moonlight slant along the carpet, and thinking of Ellen Olenska driving home across the gleaming beaches behind Beaufort's trotters. End of chapter 21